So uh, thanks everyone for attending. Uh, I'm Simon, I'm here in, actually it's pretty sunny London right at the moment, uh, not for long I guess. Um, uh, welcome to the session, if this is your first, hey, if it's your 15th, good going. Um, so today I'm joined by uh, a man who probably needs no introduction if you've attended these sessions and stuff before, but I'll do a job of trying to introduce him anyway. Um, so he's the chief architect of the TM1 server, OData evangelist, the keeper of the TM1 scrolls, uh, the star of the TM1 movie, TM1 dot film, in case you haven't seen it already. Uh, uh, Mr. Hubert Hikus. Hubert, how's it going? Um, very well, thank you. <laughs> Good stuff. All right. Um, today's sessions uh, are actually the first time Hubert's done this type of presentation remotely, i.e. not in person. Um, so we'll see how it goes. We're, we're uh, flying by the seat of our pants, but uh, let's see how it goes. Um, usually this is quite interactive. If you've seen this session before, how the TM1 server works, any of our in-person conferences, it's usually pretty interactive. We, Hubert, us, encourage questions, encourage interaction from the crowd, from the, from the attendees. Um, so please ask questions in the chat. I see already people are asking, so that's great. Um, if you have a question that you don't think you can express in words, then uh, I can unmute you and you can ask in person if you want to do that, if you're feeling brave. Um, just let me know. But I think there's a raise hand button in the Zoom, but uh, yeah, let's see how we go. Um, yeah, let's, uh, there's plenty of stuff to get on with, so I'm going to stop talking. Hand over to Hubert. Hubert, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, well, thanks, everybody. Uh, my name is Hubert Eikers. I'm coming to you live from uh, Weert in the Netherlands. Uh, and um, you know, as you probably have uh, <laughs> realized, you know, I'm going to talk about how the server really works. Uh, that is, I'm going to do uh, as a special request from, uh, from Ben, actually, to rerun um, or you know, a permutation of some presentation that I've done face-to-face -face on some of these uh, conferences before. So I'll, I'll, I'll uh, it, this is going to be getting technical, as Simon already said, right? So normally these are interactive sessions because it's important that everybody, you know, uh, understands it and, you know, follows along and stuff like that. So feel free to drop questions. Simon can then uh, relate it to me or, you know, you can raise your hand and even, you know, ask questions directly. So without further ado, um, let's get started and dive in. So the... Um, Yeah, notes and disclaimers, don't worry about those. So uh, the order in which I put a couple of stuff and the things that you know I think are the most important ones was you know to, to uh, look at you know how TM1 stores data. Um, and uh, once we get through that, we'll we'll talk a little bit about uh, feeders and uh, you know feeder rules and you know the relationship between them and what the effects are. And um, after that, um, you know, dive in a little bit uh, on, you know, dimension order and the impact on storage, memory usage, performance, potentially, and other stuff. And if we have uh, time left, um, there is, um, um, I've, I've, I'll, I'll dive into how um, blank, empty, undefined, and null suppression works. And uh, I'll give you a heads up. We're not talking about zero suppression here. And then there's a couple of other small topics that, you know, if time permitting, I have, uh, you know, left slides in for, for uh, towards the end. So let's, let's start with the, the, the big one, I guess, um, in, uh, in all of this. And that has to do with, you know, how TM1 stores data. And when it's TM1 top, so this is also going into where, you know, the many, uh, ideas uh, you know have made a, a, a big difference in what make TM1 you know uh, you know TM, you know special effectively to, to a certain extent. So to get there uh, first hi, uh, an introduction of two concepts so they're you know, clear to everybody and so I can confuse everybody after that as well because uh, we refer to these things as tries but uh, technically a try is uh, as you can see on the top right hand side, is a, is, a, is a tree in which um, uh, data is organized, in this case, little strings, right? In, in which data is organized based on um, the subsequent, in this case, characters, because we're talking about strings, right? So nothing at the top of the tree, then the first character, 
and then uh, that defines you know the first branch in the tree where things are going and the second character defines where the, the second level in the tree etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, there's a permutation of this which is you know a space optimized version of this which is called a radix tree and a radix tree you effectively are organizing data based on um, you know you know that the first character is a certain character right and then based on the next character or characters there is a split etc 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 so uh, on the bottom right there is a permutation of that um, the important difference there being that the in the the key effectively as to what makes that node or what defines that node is a um, is a is a concatenation of every node that you passed to get to that node to begin with, right? So um, <clears throat> that 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 that's you know how you can then uniquely identify where every string you would ever you know add to this list right you can you can uh, order in a uh, a tree structure and um and it, you know where where everything is again following the path and therefore the 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 concatenation of the uh, the path that you followed in the try is what makes up the the, the total you know key so let's get to what we uh, refer to internally as an MP try, which is a many press try, right? Uh, named after many. Um, and but again, it's actually a radius, radius tree, radix tree. So I'll, you know, um, sorry for the confusion here. The idea that many came up with is that um, you know when you're organizing structures and you're organizing collections of you know, let's say objects or entities, whatever you want to call them, right? You can give them all an index, a unique index. And then um, in, instead of, uh, you know, using strings or for example, right? We, he, we used uh, integer value, unsigned integer values for it, so natural positive integer values for this. And, um, <clears throat> and then split those up in nibbles. Nibbles are four bits. And they are, uh, so they have, uh, they describe a value from zero to 15. So they can have effectively 16 slots. And by doing so, um, you, 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 so you have any integer number, obviously, that you can then split up in, in nibbles. Um, back in the days, I'm not sure how many nibbles there were initially. I'm guessing four for 32 bits. Obviously, nowadays, the maximum we can do is 64 bits. So trust me, that's enough. Um, uh, slots that you can have in a tree. And the, um, the, uh, the reason for doing it that way was there was a couple of things. And one of the things was that you wanted to always have a balanced tree. So this a same depth balanced tree. And the second thing is you want to keep those trees obviously as small as possible. So based on the number of items you have, you can define how many uh, indexes you need. And obviously you want to keep those indexes as compact as possible. And that then defines the largest value effectively that you need in your index, defines the number of nibbles and therefore the number of layers that you need in your try, right? So it is the stru same structure as I showed on the previous slide where you're using characters, but in this case, we're using values from zero to 15 for each level and then split out uh, further that way. <laughs> so um, the, 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 uh, the nice thing about that as well is that, oh, sorry, no, nice thing. The, um, the least significant nibble, so the, the, the zero to 15 effectively, right, is what makes up the lowest level. And uh, what, what, what's nice about that is that extending a tree that way is really simple because this, the first time you go over 15, you just add one level and then you have 15 slots left in that top level. You can add 15 times 16 uh, items before you need to introduce another level. But adding that other level is just inserting again, a new level where the zeros, the first slot refers to the whole tree that you already have. So from a tree building and expanding point of view, very efficient way of growing trees. So <clears throat> to show that for a little bit, right? Um, 
uh, let's say we just have um, you know less than 16, right? And in this case, we're using hexadecimal representation, so it's zero to nine and then A, B, C, D, E, F. Um, uh, less than 16 uh, indexes in my tree structure, and I want to associate the value 100 with position four, right? So I'd have a, a node effectively, which is the only node in this tree where um, the uh, on, in the fourth position, the fourth slot, I'm putting the value 100, right? Now, if I then had to uh, add the value 200, right? Uh, at a position and you know, let's say you know, the, the tree is bigger, right? So in this case, I, uh, I'm using a index, which is D83 hexadecimal uh, to keep it simple. Um, then, so the, the number of elements has grown effectively, right? And I need more levels. You can see that on, on, the, the, on the bottom simple tree that that original node that I started out with in the meantime has been put underneath another node uh, which, uh, and the slot zero. And another note, slot zero. So zero, zero, four is still the same index we started with. And now I have space to associate this value 200 to an index, in this case, D83, right? And as you can see, it's D is the most significant nibble in this case that con contributes to this tree structure. And then eight is the second one slot, and then three is the third one. And that's where we associate the 300. Um, so, in fact, how these trees are built is that each slot in a tree, you know, can contain data, right? If it's not the lowest level in the tree, then the the the, the slots point to new nodes at a lower level, and at the lowest level, they point at the actual data. So. Um, <clears throat> the um, I think it's. Uh, you know, memory consumption point of view, um, it is therefore the, the indexes to which data is associated that dictates how much memory um, is required, right? Now, I'm not, this session is not about the actual memory consumption of these tri structures because we, trust me, TM1 applies all kinds of smart compressions as these nodes, if they are virtually empty or there's only one in them, then we use a different way of storing that node where it uses less memory than is if all 16 nodes were full. And obviously there's a difference between using strings versus numeric values, uh, et cetera, as well. Um, but as you saw in the previous slide, right? If I go back to the first one, one value, I needed one node in this case, right? But if the tree is bigger, right? Then for that same value, I already needed three nodes, right? Because I needed three nibbles to um, uh, to uh, express all the items that I can store in my try. And then storing two values added two nodes here, right? Now, adding a third value in one of these uh, where already a node exists doesn't cost any additional memory effectively, right? Virtually none. But adding one to... Uh, a value to something that is a different slot at the top level, for example, where it wouldn't have a value yet that would immediately at least add two nodes. So it depends on where value gets added, um, you know, how much memory that it needs. But I, I'll get back to a couple of times to a little bit of, you know, impact on memory for some of these things. Now, <clears throat> What I uh, talked about uh, up till now was, you know, a collection of objects slash entities, right? So um, typically you would use that for a dimension, right? Where the collection of objects is your products or your, your customers or whatever, right? You're trying to describe in a dimension, right? For us, if they're just elements, right? A collection of elements. So the second thing that many um, came up with and patented is apart from having these uh, tri structures as I showed you already is that uh, you can stack these tries, right? And with stacking these tries, you can span a space. And that's what the stacked MP try is for, right? So a two-dimensional, um, well, two-dimensional is not a cube, right? A table, right? Would use two tries where in the, the, the data level, the lowest level of the first try is not actually the data, 
but a reference to a new try that represents the second dimension, right? And in a three-dimensional cube, obviously, there's the, the, the bottom of the second try that is, you know, points to a new try that represents the third dimension. And then the bottom of the last dimension, point, you know, contains, again, the data, the cell value, right? Um, and that's how these stack. So the more dimensions you have in a cube, the more tries get stacked on top of each other in a stack try uh, to represent the total space uh, that exists and makes up the um, uh, makes up the cube, right? Hey Hubert, I have a question yeah. from a guy. Yeah. Um, I have a question from Adam, and I'm going to try and do my best. I think it was based on the previous slide, but um, uh, he asks, um, why does going from one data point to a second data point, i.e. from 100 to 200, um, require the generation of an additional branch? And why didn't it get 200 get stored at uh, the zero branch? Yeah. Here, yeah, good question. So uh, so the values, uh, you know, the value 100 and 200 is totally irrelevant here. This could have been... 10 and 11, or, you know, uh, <laughs> the value doesn't matter in this particular case. What matters is the positions. So it's position 004, right? Or 000004, which is the 64-bit representation of that position, and the position 0000D83, right? And um, so each nibble, each eight bits, sorry, four bits, in uh, that space. So that's why we're using hexadecimal representation because in a hexadecimal representation, each character represents a nibble, right? Um, that's what makes up the space. So um, as I said, in this, you know, when I started and I only have you know, one level, I cannot have more than 16 elements in the collection I'm representing, right? Otherwise I need more nodes, right, on the top. In the bottom one, uh, I already, you know, got into a situation where I need more than two nibbles, so uh, at least two nibbles plus one, right, um, elements in the collection, so I need three. Now, I know in this case that uh, even the value D exists, so apparently I already had, you know, almost used um, the full space of that level as well. Uh, so meaning 14 times 16 times 16, you, know, you, you, did, you did the math. Four, you know, almost 4,096 is the maximum uh, number of elements you can have if you have three levels, right? So it's not the value itself that defines where things get stored. It's the index at which a value gets stored. And these indexes in TM1 are, called, are, are internally known as cube IDs. So if people, you know, or you know, some technical people that know how the server works internally are talking about stuff. There is IDs, there's names that uniquely identify an element, but internally we have cube IDs. And the, the, the thing that people not always know is that cube IDs can change over time. And when cube IDs change over time, especially in cases where, for example, you know, dimensions get reorganized or elements get removed and other elements get added, right? It becomes very tricky to uh, you know dig around with files in the TM1 system because you might actually combine files from two situations where there's different cube IDs and then by definition your uh, your database is corrupted um, because that's what makes all these things hang together those unique cube IDs that define the association with the actual data at the end of the day. Thanks. So that was that yep. the only question, sorry? Okay. So far, yeah, there's some, some generic questions that were asked at the start, which I'll save for a bit later on, but yeah, so far, that's the one. Okay. So, um, so the stack try, right? <clears throat> let's, let's make it a little bit more tangible. Let's, let's assume we start simply with two-dimensional cube, right? So products and time. And um, uh, I've got a bunch of projects. The only one I'll be using here to associate data to is PCs, notebooks, ta tablets, printers, but it could be you know, paint, whatever, it doesn't care, right? Uh, and I gave them specific IDs, 0F, 1, 0, 1, 2, and 2A. And obviously I chose those kind of deliberately. Um, and so uh, meaning that for products alone, so the products dimension, right? Uh, I need two levels, right? I need two nibbles to describe each of these indexes for these products. 
And as you can see, the first nibble had zero, one from 10, one from one, two, and two from two A. So zero, one, and two are being used. And then on each of those get a nibble associated to it, uh, or a node associated to it representing that nibble with uh, F for zero F. Uh, the, the second one has zero and two. Uh, and then the, uh, the third one has A for two A, right? And then each of those, that's what the red Vs are trying to, uh, you know, down arrows uh, Vs are trying to point out is that for each of those, there is then a secondary, uh, you know, they point to a new tree representing the time dimension. And in this case, the time dimension I'm using January 2014 until December 2015, right? Which means um, 24 dim uh, months, right? So it's zero until one seven in hexadecimal, right? That's where the indexes come from. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, a, B, C, D, E, F, 1, A, 1, uh, sorry, uh, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. And that's why, uh, so presuming that I have data for all these months for all these products, I then have uh, for each of these tries underneath these products, um, the zero and one at the top level in this try uh, field. And then I've got values for, every slot in the zero um, you know, node, and then zero to seven in the one node, right? And you know, I try to make that clear by the first letter of the month, right? So all the months are represented there. So the total number of nodes in this two-dimensional cube, right? Is the four that are representing the product dimension, and then four times, the three that I need for the time dimension. So in this case, there is 16 nodes to store four times 24, so 96 values. And I'm hoping that this is clear that you know for each of the uh, no slots in the product dimension for which there is data, right? There is uh, for every month in this particular case, there is this try that represents the 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 months in the time dimension for which data exists in this case for every month right so it's it's, it's 16 slots so um what happens if i add a dimension right so if i add a dimension and let's say here the scenario is that uh, i have actual budget for um you know it, it, just the scenario dimension right and for all the months in 2014, I happen to have my budget numbers, but I already have actuals. And for the sake of it, for 2015, I don't have actuals yet, only budget numbers. What happens then, I need one node to represent all the elements in the scenario dimension because there are only two, right? And up to 16, I can do in one node. I need only one level in my tree, so just one node, right? But I will have one of those nodes for each uh, value where there is, um, uh, because I'm stacking this at the bottom of this list of dimensions, right? So I'm adding this to time. So I'll have one of these nodes for every case where there was already a data point for um, you know, the combination of product and time. And as I told you before, there was 96 values in there. So if I go back one slide, it was 16, right? At 96, you get to 112. Or by looking at this, it's four plus four times three plus 24 times one, right? So that's the same 112. So now there's 112 nodes to represent, in this case, uh, what is it, 24 plus 12, 36, uh, no, 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 96 plus uh, 48. Um, 144 data points. Okay, so 112 nodes, forget the data points, nodes, right? So, oh, uh, I, I seem to be missing a slide. So what happens if I had added the, uh, 
this scenario dimension at the top. Or maybe I have that slide later on when I'm talking about dimension, or I'm just going to quickly refer to it here already. Um, so what happened if I had added this scenario dimension at the top, right? So if I added this scenario dimension at the top, then I had the tree that we already had for uh, um, actuals and budgets, right? So actual and budget would be at the top. There would be only two subtrees. For actual, I would only have data for the first 12 slots, right? So I didn't need that second one, the tree, right, for, for time. And for budget, I would have it for all of them. Meaning that I would have, uh, and like this one, I needed 60 nodes for, uh, I would have needed 60 nodes for my budget numbers. I would have needed four plus four times two, 12 nodes for uh, the um, actual numbers, that's 28, plus the one that would have, re that, that would represent scenario. So 29 nodes instead of 112. Right, the total tree that we're building can contain the same amount of values. It's just that the order in which the dimensions are, you know, defines how many nodes I need to, you know, span that space uh, for for the dimensions. Again, this is purely looking at it from a memory consumption point of view. So, if this is a good idea to do this or not, we'll get back to that uh, a little later. All right. Hey, Hubert, before you go yep. on to that slide, I have a question from Girish. Yep. Um, I guess um, it talks a bit, it's a bit about the dimension stuff. So I guess it's um, it feeds on nicely. So um, um, he asked about the cube optimizer. So I guess the dimension reordering optimizer and how that impacts those structures you just talked about. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I have a section on uh, how the, about dimension order after this. Perfect. Immediately after this feed is one. So let's, let's you know, go through that one first and see if, my, if that answers the question. Otherwise, Sure. You can we're about on. half. We're about halfway through, by the way. FYI. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so uh, I'll try and see if we can do this fast. Uh, so feeders. Um, um, so there's two things, right? Feeders. I'm talking about feeders here and not feeder rules. Why is this important? Because at the end of the day, uh, feeders are just a bit in the data structure. Just looking at how you know it gets stored in TM1, right? Um, you know, feeders fire or something like that, right? It, you know, stuff like that. You know, feeders get executed, right? And, and they either at startup or when there's data changes, right? In the, uh, in the uh, being made by somebody entering data or, you know, if you, if you would write, you know, change your rules or something like that, that could trigger it as well. But after that has happened, right? Feeder bits are set and they're, they're in that structure that same structure that we've been talking about in this tree. Think about it this way, every slot that we were talking about where there can be data, right? Uh, there can be an extra little bit, a little, think about it as a flag that says, you know, I don't know the value, but I'm, I'm telling you, you should try and execute the rules to see, you know, what the value is, right? That's effectively what a feeder is. And that's, a, that's the bit that could set. There's one thing very important to know about feeders uh, uh, here, feeder bits. They get never deleted. So uh, depending on some models, this is never a problem, but in, 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 in models where you know, the elements get added, removed, added, removed, and stuff like that, and, and, and those elements get feeders associated with them, you might end up with a very fat, structure that contains feeder bits that you don't necessarily need, right? And also if you change uh, um, uh, your, your, your rules and feeders, your rules, um, you know, you might end up with feeders that, feeder bits that already existed that you no longer need, they will still be there. So in some cases you might need to redo, uh, you know, or rebuild your cube just to get rid of those uh, feeder bits that you don't want anymore. And they take up space. So a feeder bit effectively takes almost up as much space because uh, as, a, as a regular value. Why? Because that structure, the node structure that we've been talking about has to be there 
to store that feeder bit. So just to store the feeder bit, I need to have the structure in place as well. You can feed a consolidated element in a feeder rule, but we actually don't feed consolidated elements, right? That implicitly implies that every, every leaf element underneath that consolidated element gets the feeder bit. So feeding a year, which has quarters and then months underneath it means you don't, you're not setting that feeder bit on the year, you're setting the feeder bit on 12 individual months, right? Um, the last, may, yeah, last comment on the slides may be important. So um, feeder execution, especially when you're triggering it with uh, making updates to the data, they stop executing at the second they run into a cell which is already set, uh, already fed, right? Which has the feed. If you want the, uh, the feeder rules to execute irrespectively of a cell being fed, you have to set this force re-evaluation of feeders for fat cells on data change set configuration. <coughs> uh, some people sometimes need that. Um, so feeder storage, I, I kind of said it already, right? The feeder is just stored as another bit in a, in actually in a short end that's also stored next to the value in these nodes. So the try structure needs to be there, right? So uh, going back to my 100 and 200 example, right? If I needed for the 100, the, just the one branch, if I would feed that cell that is where I stored the 200, I still needed all the nodes to, to exist in the same thing, right? So it cannot add up, right? Um, but yeah, here, yeah, just as an example, right? Building on that previous example, right? Um, if we set a feeder bit in this case, right? Uh, I'm adding a feeder bit to uh, this. Where am I adding this to the second feeder bit? However, cause the addition of a foreign file. Oh, yeah. So, um, Actually, oh. this, this is effectively what I said, right? So if the if the if the structure of the of the um, the tree already has the node in which the feeder bit gets set, then there is no addition, effectively no additional cost, right? If in this particular example where I need two levels for my product, two two levels and a try structure for um, uh, time, and then uh, you know a scenario it was always one, right? And I'm feeding a uh, a product in this case cartridges, right? Which didn't have any data associated to it. That means that I get, uh, in this case, three on the product level didn't have a node yet underneath it. So that's one node, two for time, and one for scenarios. So four additional nodes in my try structure, just to store that one feeder bit. So it very much depends how expensive or how cheap memory wise it is to have feeders. Uh, dimension order, right? So um, just to remember, uh, there is two dimension orders in TM1. Um, I've named them logical or presentation order and the physical order, the storage order. Um, you know, when you create a new cube, you define a set of dimensions for the cube. And implicitly the order of that set that you specify becomes the order, the immutable logical presentation order, whatever you want, that order. The order is retained because that's the order that you use in your DB statements, your DBRWs in Excel, et cetera, et cetera, right? Because um, if, if it weren't for a consistent order, um, we simply wouldn't know how to interpret um, you know, the parameters to those uh, rule uh, TI and some, uh, you know, um, Excel functions, because they depend very much on, you know, they're, they're positional, right? So the, 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 the X um, parameter is, you know, lines up with the X dimension in that order. But as you will know, you can actually change the dimension order in TM1. And what that does is it doesn't change that logical order. So you don't have to rewrite your rules and TIs and stuff like that, or you change your Excel sheets, but you can change how the data gets stored, right? So, and uh, and that's what we're really looking at. So um, 
impact of the order on the memory footprint, I kind of alluded it already. So um, here uh, I'm doing it uh, without that scenario dimension. I'm just swapping time and product. So remember before we had these four products for which we were storing values, right? And then for each of those four, uh, we had 24 months of data, which is 96 data points. And we needed um, four times, um, so four plus four times three nodes for that, which was uh, four plus four times three is 16 nodes. If we turn this around, as you can see here, um, then I need the three because I have you know, three to represent those 24 months to which data is associated. And then for each of those 24, I need to try to represent the products for which I have data, which is the same set of four products in this simple example, right? So it is three plus 24 times four. So now all of a sudden I need 99 nodes to represent that same space in which the same set of data points, 96 in this example, are being stored. Right now, um, care to guess how many uh, nodes? <laughs> I told you that one already, right? So um, we've got that one done. So um, as you can imagine, there is uh, there is so it has it can have quite significant impact on uh, the amount of memory used to source to store a set of data points. Right. And uh, so in this previous example, right, 99 versus nine for, versus um, 16. So roughly six times the amount of memory to store the same set of data. Obviously, these are extreme cases. Right. Uh, you know, but um, it is not too hard to come up with a dimension order, which might potentially cause much more um, memory usage. Uh, but at the same time, um, there is also um, some impact of dimension order on performance. And uh, th th this, uh, I'll be honest, this is not with small cubes, right? Small cubes, uh, especially, especially tiny cubes, right? It really doesn't matter that much. You, it's, it's barely measurable. But the bigger cubes get, and when, when, you know, gigabytes and then many, many gigabytes up to a terabyte or maybe a couple of terabytes, it starts to add up. And, and why is that? Because for queries, we have to iterate the memory to affect the try structure, uh, you know, which stores obviously all the data for a cube. And at the end of the day, especially with, 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 with big cubes, the amount of memory you have to traverse, there is simply, you know, a cost to that, right? Memory that needs to be swapped into caches and stuff like that to be iterated, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, there is a, uh, a price for um, you know, iterating uh, memory. And therefore, you might think more memory is uh, therefore more expensive. Therefore, the smallest footprint I can come up with uh, might be the best one for me. But unfortunately, that's not true either. And that has to do with the fact that, you know, you typically don't uh, need the whole cube for your query. And, uh, and that gets into, um, so, it, it, so at the end of the day, it, it depends on the number of nodes that you need to traverse. So uh, whilst, um, you know, there's some, some standard rules from sparse to dense within the context of the remaining higher dimensions that you order your dimensions if you're purely looking at this, you know, trying to minimize the size. Um, if there is um, a dimension for which you always want to include, uh, typically always include in your queries and a, and a vast majority of the values or elements from a dimension versus um, just a, one leaf from another dimension, putting the, the dimension that would typically only be used, or one leaf would only be used in a query typically at the top, forgetting sparse versus dense for a second, right? Would imply that I know already that I can make at the top the decision that I only have, you know, that node, and I would only need to traverse everything underneath that node, right? Now it depends obviously on how big that dimension then is, 
but that, that, that then vastly limits the amount of memory you need to iterate. So it's a combination of, of those two effectively, right? That is, uh, is going to, uh, at the end of the day, dictate, you know, if, if a certain dimension order is, is better or worse. So um, that, that's, yeah. why, that's why going like the, with the old large sparse, small dense is a rule of thumb rather than a hard and fast rule when you're first building a cube, right? Because the, the yeah, people are finding, yeah. sorry. The use cases are important, right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So uh, I've seen at customers, especially when you go over a certain or, or according to some people already ridiculous amount of dimensions, but the you know, if you go over a certain limit, right? Where you know, in most of the queries, right, you're you're zipping down through a certain level, right? You you make decisions already on what you need, right? Those dimensions should all go to the top because they kind of give you the traverse part to the subsection of the cube you're actually looking at, right? Uh, even though you could argue that some of those might be, you know, completely dense, right? But if you only need ever you know one leaf in any of your queries then you'd still move that one up to the top right uh, and again the bigger the cube the more impact you might expect from this you know smaller cubes you it wouldn't even be measurable right um so um i think i hit on everything that's on this slide uh so but the bottom one is the most important one there's no one dimension or there's optimal for all queries that's just that's just how it is um, so, but there is also an uh, impact on dimension order for data load and update. Um, and, and that has to do, especially since we introduced parallel interaction, which has become the standard, right? So it's not longer, you know, enabled. It's the only way we do it these days because we're, we're building, um, overlay trees. Now an overlay tree is the same tree that we were talking about, uh, before, right? And so effectively the same structure is just like, you know, like the name implies, it overlays the existing one. So for the duration of the processing of a load, we actually collect all the values in a separate tree, right? Which effectively, if we would query a value from the cube, we would look in the overlay first, and if the value ain't there, then we'll take the one from, you know, what it was already in the base tree, right? And only when we commit, we merge the two together. Now, same thing here again, obviously, if you can, um, you know, if you're, if you're doing your loads in a certain way, right? It, the, the larger that overlay tree needs to be to store all the values or to contain all the values that you're loading, um, the more memory it takes, therefore the more time it costs and also makes the commit the merge between those two trees more expensive at the end of the day, right? So um, especially with larger loads, I see more and more customers, you know, split up uh, and do parallel load. And I know, you know, Cupice has rushed the eye, which is, you know, I think that's its, that's its primary use case for this, right? Um, the, 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 the only thing, the thing I can tell you here is that, you know, um, split up the data in a way that it follows your dimensions order, and then you you can get a more optimized uh, loading experience. Again, especially in large uh, large models, it becomes more noticeable. Um, uh, so as I said, you know, the bottom line says split by elements in the first dimension that has more than one element in the loads. Um, and the other thing is because parallel interaction if you start a bunch of processes that are loading data at you know exactly the same you know moment in time which is what typically happens then they all use the same base which means uh the merges of these overlay trees have to you know you know go one after the other so splitting up the amount by amount of data and especially you know uh, uh, equally spreading the amount of data um, you know, it doesn't help your performance either. You're actually better off, and depending on the amount of data and the type of data, it depends a little bit, but you're better off to have a smaller load, a small, slight, slightly larger set, a slightly larger set than that, a slightly larger set than that, et cetera, et cetera, and, and load those because uh, most efficient would be that, uh, you know, the second load 
fin parallel load finishes when the first one merged. And the third one finishes when the second one had merged after the first one, et cetera, et cetera. So just, just another hint if you want to get it as, you know, as, as optimal as possible. So equal spreading and uh, is not efficient and you know, um, not, you know, keep into account what your dimension order is. So if you have time as your last dimension and uh, you are splitting by month, that's the worst thing you can do to TM1. It, it costs the most memory and it's the most expensive uh, to, uh, to actually operate. But we'll do it. So I think that's the wrap up I already kind of did. So there's no silver bullet, right? Um, there's no guarantee, there's no one order that guarantees to deliver the best performance and the smallest footprint, right? As I said, in general, smaller memory footprints implies better performance, but depending on, and especially with larger tubes, many dimensions, um, you know, you, you um, taking into account the, the general cases, what most queries use, right? Uh, you might actually be better off with a different order that no, doesn't necessarily have the smallest footprint but results in the uh, smallest part of the overall try being iterated uh, to uh, come up with the result for such a query. How much time do I have left, uh, Simon? You have about 13 minutes. Okay, all right. Um, because I saw one hour on the top of my screen, but that's probably since we started, so okay. Um, Good. And the um, suppression. So everybody probably knows that, uh, uh, you know, um, you, you've now seen how TM1 stores the data. And so it only stores data where data exists. So it's very good in sparsity, right? That's what most people probably have heard. And why is that? Because it only builds branches to where there is data. Uh, and therefore, it does not build branches to the vast space typically where there is no data. So, so that's optimal. And, um, but this thing that, you know, uh, you know, for some reason, people always refer is zero suppression. I know even our own clients are, you know, I'm not sure if the latest one, I think the latest one changed it now, but, you know, architect and stuff like that all are talking about zero suppression. It's an enigma, but, you know, TM1 does not do zero suppression. It never, ever has, right? It is blank, empty, undefined, null, whatever you want to call it, suppression. So it is based on the fact if there is data in that try, right? So if you build a, uh, a, a if you execute a query, factively what it does, there are some exceptions and change rules and stuff like that, but you know, factually what happens is it looks at it creates a, a, a stargate, we call it internally, which is a lesser dimensional cube. And uh, it uses only the intersections for which data exists uh, to say, okay, these rows and these columns need to be there, right? And that's even before it has looked at any data, right? So feeders play in there as well, because feeders are placeholders as well. Remember, they take up a path in that try. So it's either the feeder bit and the, um, uh, and or the existence of real data that then dictates that it is there. That is also the reason why if you underfeed a cube that your cells are gone if you do suppression because TM1 will never look at that because that branch in that try structure doesn't exist. So it presumes there is no data, right? There is definitely no data, but you didn't tell it to execute a rule and see if there is data either. So it's gone, it, it's, you know, it's uh, just, you know, not looked at to begin with in the first place. So um, suppression is therefore based on the shape of that try structure. And it says here of the Stargate that underpins the query view, but the Stargate is a less dimensional version of the cube again, which is represented in the same tri structure that we've been looking at uh, up till this point, right? So it traverses that one and that's what, you know, it builds the extent. Um, filters it out. Not having a skip tag of feeders would result in the same behavior. Um, 
that's only if you obviously if you feed it correctly, right? Uh, it just would take longer. Um, and yeah, DM1 is very good at it because it simply doesn't store uh, the uh, any you know um, data. The space effectively isn't defined where there is no data. Therefore, it doesn't iterate that space either. And therefore, it's very efficient, obviously, in in in, in processing that uh, that part of it. Um, locking, completely different thing, right? Uh, but a topic that, uh, uh, you know, most of the times when people talk to me, at least about locking, it's always in a negative, um, in a negative way for some reason. So I, I uh, with this section, I, I, I want, I want to change that a little bit. So, so why, why, why locking, right? So, um, so locking is, um, it is a mechanism that we use to protect our internal structures from being updated concurrently by multiple uh, operations, right? Um, and it's a it's it's a very much standard based two phase locking protocol that we're using, which you know thousands of services out there use, often database uh, services as well. It's it's very standard. It has, it, it's a standard pattern in which that when an operation starts and when you build up your operation, right, you're only taking locks out effectively. They call that the expansion phase, right? And what, once every, all the operations are done and all the, uh, the, uh, uh, the objects that you're touching, trying to, to, to change and stuff like that, are uh, you know, processed, you set them up, effectively you got the locks to, and you are allowed to, to, to do it, then the shrinking phase, phase starts, which is what we call the commit phase in TM1, right? It's committing, right? And the commit itself is when, uh, uh, when it uh, you know, uh, persists the changes, you know, applies them, it has exclusive access to these objects which are changing, and then it releases all the locks again so that a, a next operation can take its turn and do whatever it needs to do in, in the system. Um, now, if, if, if operations that are running in the system are uh, not uh, trying to change the same thing, right? Then apart from potentially having to wait for each other for a little bit, then, uh, um, you, know, you wouldn't even notice it effectively. You only notice it when uh, you know when there is stuff going on um, that is actually uh, going to interfere with uh, in the operation with the other operations that might be going on, right? Um, so, so again, in a single transaction, right? So, so a team one doesn't ha ex uh, externalize this transaction concept, but internally, every operation effectively um, in the API and with the old API, REST API has improved a lot there, but the old APIs, every operation effectively was have that expansion phase and shrinking phase, right? Even though often it was only read locks that were taken out. Um, the only exception to that is by the way, processes and chores, right? Um, Oh yeah, the, the matrix on the right is um, if you're you know familiar and want to be in a little bit of details, locks are compatible with each other or not, right? So this is the matrix which tries to uh, show uh, what's compatible with what, right? If nothing has a lock, you know every lock is compatible. Uh, but you know read read only locks with read locks. You know in um, uh, I actually intend to change locks or intend to take an exclusive lock on something, right? Uh, is one and uh, IXMC is a special case for that because that's a newly object being created. So not to worry typically with that one. And then eventually the right is the level which you get through the commit phase. So in commit, uh, that's you know after you had the exclusive access and no more readers are in there, then you temporarily get the right access. And then that's when you can make the actual change uh, in the system. And the right obviously is incompatible with everything because Otherwise, uh, you know, you, you couldn't guarantee uh, consistency in the system. So again, locking is perfectly standard. It's part of the two-phase locking protocol, which is applied to just, you know, make sure that we can in high concurrency uh, do operations in a system, in this case, TM1. Hey, so, you, yeah. 
We've got five minutes left, so just FYI. Yeah, okay. So what causes blocking? Uh, oh, this will be the last topic then. So what causes blocking? Well, um, as it kind of implied, right, if you have, uh, you know, operations that are, um, uh, you know, competing for the same objects and try, are trying to make change to the same topic and therefore need the same locks effectively, right? That's where, um, you know, things interfere with each other and therefore one thread has to wait, one operation has to wait for the other one, right? So effectively what happens is when you, you know, on the right hand side, you follow the graph a little bit, right? You know, something needs a, a certain lock, right? It looks if, if it has a lock at that level on that object already, if that's the case, then no further action is required. You have the lock, you know, you have a lock already at a more restrictive mode, also fine, right? Uh, it's nobody else uh, holding a lock that, uh, you know, is conflicting with it. That's based on that previous uh, ch chart on the previous page. Then the lock is granted and otherwise you'll be blocked, right? And that's perfectly fine. I said, that's still part of it, right? And that's where these wait events come, you know, and due to time, I I'll, I'll, won't go into the details, but you've seen these, if you've looked in top, right? What these, you know, you have an IXC, right? Um, somebody's requesting one or somebody else is holding one uh, or somebody's asking one, but somebody has a read already or, you know, write is not because there's still readers there, et cetera, et cetera, right? So those are the standard lock, complete locks, which are there. Um, the last one is the one that, right, where it might be uh, that lock, but, you know, again, that case is typically solved by the system as well, because if it, if it finds a that lock, it just rolls back one of the operations and lets it retry again. So again, that's, the, the the blocking is a side effect, obviously, of the locking mechanism where there's multiple uh, uh, operations that are competing for the same um, uh, threat. So um, I think I said most of these already. Um, it's a concurrency uh, control me mechanism, which is, you know, governing what we need to do. It's, it's needed. It's just part of normal life. You know, so uh, locking and locking conflicts are uh, typically perfectly fine. Um, Obviously, if you are running large operations and the large operations, and so you know that large operations are acting on certain objects, right? And, you know, so you know by definition that, you know, certain locks are needed there. You might be better off, uh, you know, not running those concurrently, but schedule those appropriately as opposed to having the system deal with it because the system will just, you know, randomly, depending on the order in which things happen, just throw one back. And that might be the one that you do, don't want the system to actually roll back and reapply, right? Um, but other than that, part of normal operation. All right, um, I'll stop here. Um, Simon, is there, are there any questions uh, left? Well, there is one question that's come up two or three times. Uh, okay. I guess it's not a Hubert presentation unless somebody asks about uh, the future feederless TM1 engine. Uh, uh, yeah, so I know you've got a session later on. Maybe it's just a trail or a tease into the future. It's a tease. If, if, I, if I get to that, then yes, I'll say something about it in that uh, future of TM1 presentation there. But uh, I, 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 I can put minds to ease here. I have a complete dedicated team working on that. It's just taking uh, somewhat longer than we hoped uh, as well. But there's two big major phases coming after TM112, which I'll talk about and demo later which are improving our MDX execution engine. And on top of that, later on the internal aggregation engine, which is completely featureless. Nice. Yes. All right, cool. Well, I, I think I've seen some of these slides two or three times to you, but every time I learn. <laughs> yeah. It's awesome, Good. really appreciate it. Lots of, lots of comments in the chat and stuff. So uh, I'll get back to you guys in the chat if, uh, if I've missed your... Uh, Miss your comment, um, but yeah, check out Hubert's presentation later on, three hours from now, actually, um, on the same stream, um, how the, uh, the future of the team on server, but uh, yeah, thanks Hubert, thanks very much everyone.